This podcast features criminologists discussing sensitive themes and topics. Listener discretion is advised. A mother of a mass shooter is convicted of manslaughter, but many have asked, should a parent be held responsible for the crimes of their children? This is the Jennifer Crumbly story. Good morning, Megan. Good morning. Wonderful to see you as always. I'm super excited for today's case and I must give you credit because you're the one who urged me to do this case. So thank you, Megan. Well, it came at the urging, I think, of our supporters. I think people who listen to the show and I will say my students were eager to discuss this one. So I think this is on the minds of a lot of people, a lot of different people. And this case is everywhere right now because of the recent verdict. And as you hinted at, I mean, it shocked many people. Mm -hmm. And this ruling is huge because it has the potential to change the way that cases are prosecuted in the future. Yeah. I want to give a shout out to one of our supporters for their thoughts on this case. During our last happy hour, we had a discussion about this one. Yes. And Cecilia, one of our newest supporters who is from Michigan, where this case takes place, she schooled me a lot. Uh, I never knew what a purple state meant. Did you know what a purple state meant? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. For our listeners who don't know, just like I didn't know, a purple state is a state that is sometimes blue and sometimes red, politically speaking. Now, at the time of this recording, we don't yet have all the final outcomes. So what we will do is provide an episode update as Jennifer is due to be sentenced on April 9th. But for now, let's go through all the details leading up to this groundbreaking verdict. Jennifer was born in 1979 and grew up in Clarkston, which is a small town outside of Detroit, Michigan. In 2005, she married James Crumbly. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that she was like around our age. Oh, yeah, she's, um, I want to say 47 right now, 45 at the time of the events we're discussing. Maybe even younger. I was born in 78. So, wow, I just I, I didn't imagine that she was around our age. That surprised me for some reason. But OK. Now, I'm not sure exactly how they met or even how long they dated before getting married. But I can tell you that James was two years older than her. And by all accounts, the union started out as a happy one, as most unions do. Right hmm. now, the couple lived in Florida, where James was originally from. And Jennifer also became a stepmother because James had one son from a previous marriage. And he was a toddler at the time the two got together. Mm -hmm. It seemed to many outsiders that Jennifer wore the pants in the relationship as James was the more passive one. And though the two were happily married, they did have some struggles as the couple had a few brushes with the law. They both got a DUI in 2005, along with several other traffic infractions. And James also had a charge for driving with a suspended license. And then there was Jennifer, who was caught a few times for writing bad checks. Okay. In 2006, the Crumbleys left Florida for Oxford, Michigan, which is a small town about 40 miles north of Detroit. Here, they also welcomed a baby boy that they named Ethan, and he would be the only child that James and Jennifer would have together. Now, sometimes James's son from his previous marriage and Jennifer's stepson, he would stay with the family on and off, but he mostly resided with his mother in Florida because reports say that him and Jennifer just didn't get along very well. Mm -hmm. Throughout Ethan's early years, Jennifer switched careers a few times. She worked in a restaurant, and then she worked as a real estate agent, and then as a social media assistant at a real estate company. She excelled there and was later promoted to marketing director. And based on what I could find, it looked like she was the primary breadwinner in the family, as James didn't seem to have steady employment. He did work at a telemarketing company, and some reports say he also had various jobs in sales in the tech industry. This was a bit before he got a gig working for DoorDash, and that's what he was doing at the time of the events we are discussing. Okay. The Crumpley's neighbors would say that James was often home while Jen was out. And Megan, she was out a lot. As I mentioned, she worked full time and she excelled at her job, so she definitely put in a lot of hours. But when she wasn't working, she also spent a lot of time at a nearby horse farm where she boarded and rode two of the horses that she owned. Oh. Now she would go there about three days a week. And this was an expensive hobby. Um, I read reports that it's cost the family over 20000 a year on the horses. Yeah, horses are very expensive. Jennifer also spent time volunteering at a nearby ski resort called Pine Knob. Now, this is a ski resort that she had spent some time skiing when she was younger. So she had ties to this location. And she would spend about 10 hours there every Saturday. The a busy woman. 
She was clearly a very busy woman. And I also didn't mention she was also having a few extramarital affairs. And I just simply don't know where she found the time to do this. But um, that was also going on as well. Okay. Neighbors reported that the family mostly kept to themselves, though they described James as a pretty friendly guy. He was often seen hanging outside, grilling in the backyard, or lighting off firecrackers. And there's also reports that he grew marijuana at home. But aside from Jennifer's volunteer work at the ski lodge, the Crumpleys weren't really an active part of the community in any way. And there also seemed to be some issues with James's ex-wife, as it was reported that he didn't pay child support that he was mandated to. Mm. So this could be because the Crumbleys were struggling financially, possibly due to James's uh, spotty employment. Maybe the horses were out of their budget. And, you know, the longer the marriage went on, it seemed that the financial strain and infidelity and probably other factors as well led the relationship to take a bit of a downturn. I see. Neighbors reported that Jennifer and James often had loud fights that could be heard. And it had gotten bad enough that the couple was planning to separate in the summer of 2021. Okay, so this is after they've been married 16 years. Got it. Correct. Ethan, again, their younger son, he was described as a quiet, nice kid. Mm -hmm. He wasn't very socially involved, but Megan, let me point out that COVID was during his early teen years. So I think for a lot of teens, they weren't very socially involved during that time. Awful. Um, at one point, Ethan was part of the bowling team at school, and he was also employed as a dishwasher at a local diner. But other than that, he didn't seem to do much outside of the home. And though he was a pleasant boy, his relationship with his parents seemed pretty distant and atypical to some. Jennifer even once told a coworker that Ethan was weird and that he wasn't out doing things like a normal kid. Oh. She also said that he only had one friend and that he spent a lot of his time online or playing games. Mm -hmm. And he just seemed to keep to himself. Um, I want to mention this one friend that Ethan also spoke with. That friend would move away, leaving him likely with no friends that he really had contact with. And Megan, we know a lot of kids can be described as weird. Um, we work in a field in which we're around teenagers often. Yeah. But this seemed a little different. It wasn't just your average, you know, someone trying to find themselves. You see, just before Ethan's 15th birthday, things took an alarming turn. For one, he sent his mother a series of text messages reporting to her that he was hearing things. Okay. On March 9th, 2021, he wrote, Can you get home now? There is someone in the house. I think someone walked into the bathroom and flushed the toilet and left the light on. And I thought it was you, but when I came out, no one was home. There is no one in the house, though. Dude, my door just slammed. Maybe it's just my paranoia. But when are you going to get home? What was the response? This is a problem. It's not clear that there was a response at all. Okay. And if there was one, it hasn't been made public. But it seems as though Jennifer possibly ignored these texts. And then about a week later, there were more texts suggesting that he seemed to still be hallucinating. Okay, he wrote, the house is now haunted. Some weird shit just happened and now I'm scared. He continued, I got some videos and a picture of the demon. It is throwing bowls. I am not joking. It fucked up the kitchen. I am just going outside for a while. And then finally he texted, can you at least text back? That's sad. That part is sad. And I do remember some of these yeah. uh, messages from the case. Yeah. Again, it's unclear what, if anything, Jennifer responded to him. I'd love to think that maybe she called him or even immediately came home to him, as maybe most parents would do if their child seemed to be in distress. But sadly, given what we come to find out about her parenting and her responses to Ethan, this is unlikely. Yeah. Shortly after these texts, Ethan had what I guess we can call a meltdown. Mm. Jennifer texted her husband, James, that Ethan was, quote, really worked up and out of control. That evening, rather than calling a doctor or seeking professional help for their son, Jennifer gave Ethan something that would help him sleep. Now, I'm not sure exactly what it was. Some reports suggest it may have been melatonin or it could have been Xanax. Mm -hmm. And if it was Xanax, this is quite problematic, given that I do not believe he had an actual prescription for that drug. Sure. And that's not a drug you should just give your child. No. So that evening, Ethan fell asleep in his parents' bed. Now, I think this becomes important later, these text messages and some of this information, because we're starting to get the picture of a mother who knows that her son is clearly in distress and yet did not get him any help. Right. And things would continue. Around the same time that he texted his mother about hallucinating, Ethan had told that one friend he had that he felt awful and he had not been sleeping well. Oh. And just for context, this was around the spring of 2021. Mm -hmm. He also shared with the same friend that he was laughing and crying in the shower and he had tried to talk to his parents, but they simply would not listen to him. This is just so heartbreaking because it, it shows a kid who's suffering from mental health and looking for help 
and clearly receiving none from the very people who should have been there to help him when he was in distress. And it's not even like he's looking for help in indirect ways or there's hints. He's directly saying, help me, which it does make it more heartbreaking. He absolutely is. He also texted this friend that he thought he was having a mental breakdown and he was thinking about calling 911 himself, but he was afraid that his parents would be, quote, really pissed. Now, his friend, to my knowledge, did not tell an adult or try to help Ethan in any way. And I am not at all blaming this friend or this teenager for anything. Sure. But I think this just highlights the importance that we talk to our children and to teenagers and, you know, children in our life. We need to tell children the appropriate response to situations like this. Yeah. If my friends were talking to one of their friends who was saying these things, I would hope that my children would come to me and say, you know, something seems to be going on with Ethan. Unfortunately, it's very possible his friend didn't have adults in his life that were helpful either. Right. Not long after, Ethan texted his friend, I'm going to ask my parents to go to the doctors tomorrow or Tuesday again. Now, again, is likely referring to the possibility that he had asked his parents to go to the doctor previously. Right. As there's not evidence, to my knowledge, that he had recently seen a doctor. Right. Yeah. So again, he's indicating that this is something that's been ongoing. He also told this friend that when he tried to talk to his parents before about how he was feeling, his father had given him some medication. Unclear what medication, maybe the Xanax, not sure. Ethan says his father told him to suck it up and that his mother laughed. He told his friend, quote, she makes everyone feel like shit. Gosh, this, this is awful. And the text continued, quote, this time I'm going to tell them about the voices. I only told them about the people I saw. He also complained of a rash and told his friend, I am mentally and physically dying. And unfortunately, this behavior seemed to be escalating and no one would know about these texts until after it was too late. Very irresponsible. These parents are also medicating him without any background, uh, and you know, unless he was pres prescribed medication and we're unaware, but it doesn't sound like that. I don't like that. It's also possible they were just giving him melatonin or something over the counter. You know, okay. we can't we can't really say for sure. sure. That would be and that would be fine for sleep. Yeah. But anything yeah. else would be concerning. In August of 2021, Ethan sent his friend a video of himself handling his father's 22 caliber pistol and loading the gun and pulling back the safety. He texted, my dad left it out. So I thought, why not? LOL. And then he told his friend he knows gun safety, so it's not a problem. But then Ethan texts again saying, quote, now it's time to shoot up the school. JK, 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 JK. Again, the friend still didn't do anything as far as we know. He didn't tell anyone. Maybe the friend thought he was kidding. Yeah. But again, it's also possible that his friend just didn't know what to do with this information. It's very clear, though, that these texts were showing Ethan's declining mental health. Yes. Reports say that around this time, Ethan also began harming animals. Mm. Allegedly, this is when his parents were not home. And what he would do is he would torture and decapitate baby birds and make videos of it. Oh. For many months, he had kept the remains in his room, and he told his friend on October 11th, 2021, holy shit, my mom legit almost found the bird head. She pulled away the sheet covering it, and it was fully exposed, but IDK, how the fuck didn't she see it? Again, no blame on this friend, but things are escalating here. You know, we need to teach our children, if you hear anything that's alarming, such as harming animals or playing with guns, like you need to tell an adult. I was not aware about this aspect either. Just so you know, I wasn't aware that there was he was yeah. harming and mutilating animals. I mean, oh my gosh, this this is like almost reminiscent of like Jeff Dahmer's keeping, you know, body parts in his closet and his dad almost discovering them. And I mean, I'm not it's not the same because, you know, it was an animal, but it's very, mm -hmm. very alarming. And it almost sounds like Ethan wanted to get caught. Mm -hmm. And he was almost like upset that his mom overlooked it. So again, these cries for help are very clear. So maybe his friend thought he was kidding. Maybe the friend was scared. But more importantly, why didn't Ethan's parents get him the help he so desperately needed? So although his parents were reconciling by this point and no longer separating their marriage, mm -hmm. things were getting worse for Ethan as his grandmother died and so did a family dog that he was very attached to. And these are terrible things to happen to anyone, but especially for a kid who's already unstable, this can be quite jarring. Did his parents' separ separation then precipitate some of the kind of worse or worsening behavior or mental health conditions? It almost sounds like around the time they were destabilizing, he was as well. 
Yeah, it's possible. So it seems like there were a lot of different events that probably led to his decompensation. And he also, around the same time, I don't think you'll be surprised to learn, he began spending more time on dark websites. And these websites were devoted to discussions on murder and school shootings. Okay. And Megan, just in that month of November of 2021, he visited the site 421 times. Whoa. Everyone parents different, and I'm not in the business of telling anyone how to parent, but how can the parents not check his browser history or not check his text messages? He's only 15 years old, and they have no idea what he is doing on this device. Well, I understand also that we don't judge parenting. However, parenting or neglectful parenting is at the very heart of this case, so... That does beg the question, should they have been monitoring this um, Mm -hmm. and to what degree? Yep. He also kept a journal in the fall of 2021, and it would later come to light that he wrote, quote, I have fully mentally lost it after years of fighting my dark side. My parents won't listen to me about help or a therapist. And it was around this time that he also wrote about his desires to shoot up the school. Okay. Now, his father, James, knew about the journal and had even encouraged him to express his feelings in it but neither parent had ever looked at it, which I don't necessarily think is a bad thing because we have to respect our children's privacy. But again, like I said, you know, not checking the journal is one thing, but Mm -hmm. never checking his phone or his browser history, I think that maybe is where they could have dropped. You know, I think that's maybe where they could have done things different in this respect. There's a lot of things that they obviously could have done that they didn't. But no, I would not fault a parent for not reading their child's journal. In fact, I think that's, you know, a nice way to encourage children to work through some of these thoughts and get out some of these emotions. Yep. On November 26th, the Friday after Thanksgiving, James took Ethan with him to a nearby gun shop to purchase a gun as an early Christmas present. So they bought a gun for around $600. And during this visit, James also checked a box stating that he understood it was illegal to buy a gun for someone else. And he also signed a form which acknowledged that his new gun came with a safety lock. Mm Mm-hmm. Later that day, Ethan posted a photo of the handgun on his Instagram with the caption, just got my new beauty today with heart-eyed emojis. The next day, Jennifer posted a picture on her social media. Now, this was of her and Ethan at a shooting range with the caption, mom and Sunday checking out his new Christmas present. My first time shooting a nine millimeter, I hit the bullseye. So the two, mother and son, had spent about a half hour at the range and went through 100 rounds of 9mm ammunition that day. Now, CCTV shows the two, and it shows Ethan seemingly teaching Jennifer how to use the firearm. And I want to say here, there's nothing wrong with going to a shooting range, but this information is going to become very relevant later on in this story. Right. And and I don't know much about guns, but in most places, kids over 10 can go to the shooting range and fire rounds if they are accompanied by an adult. And this is cultural in many parts of the country. A lot of these places are even advertised as Mm family-friendly. Under federal law, it is illegal for a minor to own a handgun, but there is an exemption for target practice. So this, there is absolutely nothing wrong with this activity. Sure. I've definitely seen this uh, and, and know of people as well who have gone to the firing range supervised with children. This is allowable practice, and there is a responsible way to do this If you want to, Um, it just doesn't sound like this was a child who should have been doing that. Also, it was not supposed to be a gun purchased for him. Mm -hmm. So it would have been a very different scenario if this was a firearm that the parents, one of the parents owned and they were teaching him to responsibly shoot. Um, But that's not the scenario here. So this is very different Mm -hmm. than the scenario you described. A few days later, a teacher noticed Ethan searching the web for ammunition on a school computer. Now, the teacher notified school officials who quickly contacted Ethan's parents via phone and email, but they did not get a response back. But later that day, Ethan got a text from Jennifer saying, quote, LOL, I'm not mad at you. You have to learn not to get caught. Mm -hmm. Again, I am no parenting expert, but I don't think this is the proper way to deal with this situation. It's certainly not. Then that night, Ethan recorded two videos on his phone talking about shooting and killing students. And again, no one would know about this until after the fact. But if his parents were looking at his phone, they would have seen all of this. Mm -hmm. November 20th, 2021 started out as a normal day. Jennifer and James went to work and Ethan went to school. That morning, however, a teacher noticed something strange on Ethan's desk. She had handed out a math worksheet and rather than doing the problems, Ethan was drawing. 
And what he was drawing was a violent scene that depicted shooting. Now, the illustration showed a semi-automatic handgun pointing at the words, the thoughts won't stop, help me. And it included a drawing of bullets with the words blood everywhere written above it. Then the words, my life is useless. Then the world is dead. And you can see this drawing. It's available online. It is very disturbing. And between the drawing of the gun and the bullet is a drawing of a person who is bleeding from the head, who appears to have been shot twice. Below the figure that had been shot, there is a drawing of a laughing emoji. Now, the teacher took a picture of this drawing and immediately alerted school officials. School officials then contacted Ethan's parents, and there was an immediate meeting held with the parents and Ethan. Now, by this point, the drawing had been altered. So once, you know, the teacher saw him, he changed the picture. But luckily, that teacher had a picture of the original drawing. Smart. So now the new drawing shows that Ethan had scribbled out the gun and the dark phrases. Now he wrote OHS rocks and I love my life so much, explanation point, explanation point, explanation point. And we're all friends here and harmless act. You can see a picture of both mm-hmm. the original document and the altered document online. Mm-hmm. When they asked him about this picture, Ethan told them that he wanted to be a video game designer and that's why he was drawing the pictures. Ethan assured them that everything was okay and there was nothing to be worried about. And Ethan's parents didn't seem too concerned. Now, school officials instructed the parents to seek mental health counseling for suicidal ideation. And they said that they must do this within 48 hours. I don't know exactly why 48 hours. Um, It's possible that it was the protocol in the school. Yeah. To me, it seems like there maybe needs to be immediate response here. I'm not sure that waiting 48 hours is the right move here. But didn't the school ask them to take him out that day? They suggested like he should probably go home and the parents decided that um, he should stay in school. And this is really sad because Michigan is a state that actually has a lot of support for mental health crises. I know they have a program, it's called Common Ground, that provides free immediate crisis support. It's very likely that the parents were made aware of this, but I can't know for sure. I just think it's a problem that they didn't take him out of school and deal with the seriousness of this immediately. Yeah, so the meeting only lasted 15 minutes. School officials say that Ethan seemed very calm, and they said it didn't seem problematic to let him stay in school. And he didn't even receive any discipline because technically he didn't break any rules, Mm -hmm. you know, by expressing himself through drawing. Right. Megan, what no one knew, though, was that during that meeting, Ethan had a loaded gun in his backpack, which nobody thought to search. Well, his parents also never mentioned the recent gun purchase. Right. Oh. And, you know, it was shocking to many that when given the option, Jennifer and James didn't take Ethan home. Yeah. They decided they were going to leave him there and they had to go back to work. Some reports say that they had to go to work and they didn't want to leave Ethan at home alone because they were worried about his well-being. But recall, he was left home alone quite a bit. Ethan was returned to class to finish out the day. Gosh, such a such a crisis that could have been averted. This is an awful point at which to, you know, reflect on this tragedy. And I also could imagine that in this situation, Ethan felt once again that his parents didn't care and they were ignoring his biggest cry for help yet. Yeah. And once she got back to work, Jennifer told her coworkers that she needed to find a therapist for Ethan. So maybe now she finally thinks it's time for, you know, to seek help. But unfortunately, it would be too little too late. Right. And Megan, no one could have imagined how the rest of the day would go. At 1220 that same day, Jennifer texted Ethan, are you okay? And he responded, yeah, I just got back from lunch. And then Jennifer wrote, you know you can talk to us and we won't judge. So I don't know if maybe she's finally realizing how dire the situation was. I'm not sure, but I can tell you that at 1242, she received a text from Ethan and this would be the last text she would ever get from him. And it said, I know, thank you. I'm sorry for that. I love you. Mm. Less than 10 minutes later, at 12.51 p.m., Ethan would be seen on CCTV wearing a backpack heading into the boys' bathroom. Between one and two minutes later, he exited the bathroom holding a gun, sans backpack, and began to methodically and deliberately walk the hallways, aiming and firing his gun at students. And many reports say that he was clearly aiming for their heads. When students ran, he would just continue to go down the hallway again at a methodical pace, and he would also shoot inside classrooms and at students who hadn't yet escaped. 911 had received over 100 calls in that short time, mostly from students who were panicked hiding in classrooms. 
And if you want, you can hear some of these calls online as well. Mm. Ethan was apprehended eight minutes after the first 911 call came in, and he was in handcuffs by minute nine. Now, this is a very impressive response time. It is. I'm not sure how close the police department was to the school, but it is known that a school resource officer was on the scene and was able to help very quickly apprehend Ethan. Upon apprehension, Ethan put down the gun and surrendered without incident. Around 1.15 p.m., news reports emerged about a shooting at the high school, and just minutes later, at 1.22 p.m., Jennifer Crumbly texted her son, Ethan, don't do it. And then at 1.37 p.m., James Crumbly called 911 to report that a gun was missing from his house and that he believed that his son may be the shooter. Jennifer would also text a friend saying, I wish we had warnings, something. He's a good kid, made a terrible decision. That's a terrible text to send. And that is going to come back to haunt her. Yes. And Jennifer's friend responded, there probably were warnings, but nobody saw them. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. Right. Despite the incredible response time from law enforcement, Ethan Crumbly had killed four students. Hannah St. Juliana, 14, Madison Baldwin, 17, Tate Meyer, 16, and Justin Schilling, 17. And he wounded seven others, including a teacher, and left countless others traumatized. I want to take a moment to discuss the young lives that were lost. Madison Baldwin was expected to graduate that year and had already been accepted to several colleges, some with full scholarships. The oldest of three siblings, she was described as a sweet, loving girl who loved to draw, read, and write. Tate Meyer was a star football player who had been on the varsity team since he was a freshman at Oxford High School. Not only an athlete, he excelled academically and was an honor student. This victim died on the way to the hospital after a deputy loaded Tate into his car after the shooting. Hannah St. Juliana was the youngest victim at just 14 years old, and she was a star basketball player who was described as silly and kind with a strong passion for basketball. Justin Schilling was an athlete and a scholar. His loved ones described him as devoted and hardworking, as he held three jobs while excelling in school and sports. People say he was simply a pleasure to be around. A journal found in Ethan's backpack detailed his, quote, desire to shoot up the school, and it also said that he wanted to murder students. While in custody, Ethan didn't hold back. He told officials that he had asked his father to buy him a specific gun, and he confirmed that he gave his father the money for the gun, and that the semi-automatic handgun wasn't kept in a locked safe. Mm. Now, at the time, this wasn't illegal in Michigan, although in many states, this fact itself would have constituted a crime. Right. And I'm referring to the safe storage. Mm -hmm. Ethan pled guilty to 24 charges, including first degree premeditated murder and terrorism causing death. A Miller hearing was held to determine if it was constitutional for the court to sentence Ethan to life without parole. Now, the purpose of this hearing was to gather additional facts. Megan, I know you're familiar with the landmark case of Miller versus Alabama, but for our listeners and our viewers, um, this was a landmark Supreme Court case in 2012 where the court established that life without parole for juveniles was unconstitutional in that it was a violation of the Eighth Amendment right against cruel and unusual punishment. Now, this would only be in violation if additional factors were not considered. These factors became known as the Miller factors and must be considered by a judge before sentencing any juvenile to life without parole. These Miller factors include age and maturity, family and home environment, circumstances of the offense, including the exact role that the person played, incapacities that may have disadvantaged the youth during criminal justice proceedings, and the potential for rehabilitation. I thought Miller precluded any juvenile from being sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. I thought Miller actually established that all juveniles had to have some option for parole at some point. So you're actually saying that Miller allows for certain factors to be aggravating, meaning that there are some juveniles that can be sentenced to life without parole? Yes. And Megan, I think we have the same brain because I checked this several times. (laughs) Yeah. I was under the same impression. And in fact, I teach it that way. Yeah. But it turns out like this has been looked at retroactively also. There was a court case after Miller v. Alabama that said it could be applied retroactively. Right. And basically what that means is juveniles who were sentenced to life without parole would go back and have this hearing whereby a judge would now consider these factors. 
Okay, so I did know I did know that. Yes, I had um, a colleague of mine who I wrote. I think it was my second book with. He was doing evaluations under the Miller standard, going into the courts and going into the prisons and evaluating juveniles for their uh, for the new appropriateness of resentencing under Miller. I guess I just didn't understand that there were certain factors that still allowed. It's like aggravating and mitigating factors. So it almost reminds me of the second phase of the death penalty. Once guilt has been decided, but in you know, then they decide are there mitigating factors to lessen one's guilt or aggravating factors to increase one's guilt. So that's interesting. I think that's a good way to think about it. Is yeah, it's almost like a penalty phase yeah. hearing where you have to decide if it's appropriate. And I know today's episode focuses on Jennifer, Megan, but before we go any further, any theories that can help us understand Ethan's crime. We know our listeners and now viewers love to hear us talk about this stuff. So what do we think? I can tell you my thoughts, but let's hear yours first. Well, I mean, of course, Ethan is he he fits almost the profile of what we established as school shooters. And sometimes the profile is wrong, but he does seem to be a kid who was, you know, on the fringes of being inclusive or having any social bonds. So it doesn't sound like he had friends. It sounds like he had an awkward relationship with parents. Um, I, I don't know so much inside of their relationship, but there does seem to have been something off about this relationship in terms of closeness. You know, he's reaching out to his parents, but it doesn't sound like they were accepting or understanding at first. Um, he sounds like a lonely, frustrated, sad kid who was experiencing deteriorating mental health. He was seemed to be hallucinating. So you kind of have a lot of factors going on here, both psychological factors, but then also sociological factors Mm -hmm. in terms of social bonds and attachment. And, you know, he seems to be lacking in many ways. And I do think, as I said before, I suspect that his parents destabilization and other major triggers exacerbate Mm -hmm. any of these feelings and make them so substantially worse, especially for teenagers. Mm -hmm. Remember in the teenage mind too, things are much worse than they seem at the time Mm -hmm. or that they are. Yeah. I think Ethan Crumbly is one of these cases that we, when we teach our students, when we talk about integrated theories of, you know, criminality or criminology, because he clearly has some traits Um, He definitely suffered from severe, persistent mental health issues. Mm -hmm. But then you see someone who has really weak attachments, like you said. Mm -hmm. He doesn't really have any outdoor commitments or involvements. Um, It's not clear to me what his belief system was. Um, Mm -hmm. It seems like he also was experiencing a lot of strain. Remember, his grandmother Mm -hmm. passed away. His parents were having issues. His dog passed away. So it's almost like the perfect storm. He had... Yeah. You know, things going on internally and then the environmental triggers um, led him to what happened. To my knowledge, though, he was never actually given a mental health diagnosis. Right. Now, I would assume that he would have had to have a competency hearing before court proceedings even began. But I couldn't find any information about that, which I found pretty interesting. He was well, he was tried as an adult, um, clearly, given the conversation we've had. So did his lawyers ask for a competency hearing? I mean, they might not have been arguing competency at the time he was tried. That's different than arguing he wasn't capable of distinguishing right from wrong at the time of the actual Mm -hmm. crime. Yeah, but if I was the defense, I would have asked for a competency evaluation to, you know, just try to push things off a little. Or lay the foundation or really see what his competency was. Let's see what his diagnosis is. Also, maybe let's get him medicated. It's clear that, you know, he has a lot going on. And even though he is now a convicted murderer, you know, he still deserves medical treatment, I would think. I'd be really curious to know how early he started experiencing um, hallucinations, as you say, and what the triggering events were for those. I think that's what I one of the areas I'd be most interested in. Yeah. Meanwhile, Jennifer and James were nowhere to be found. Because, Megan, they fled. So, Megan, at a press conference just days after the shooting, Oakland County Prosecutor Karen McDonald, who herself was a mother of five and also a former teacher, she announced that she would be charging Ethan Crumbly's parents as well. She said, quote, I am angry. I'm angry as a mother. I'm angry as a prosecutor. 
I'm angry as a person that lives in this country. The prosecutor further stated that Ethan's parents had, quote, grossly neglected the parental duty by not averting the obvious danger their son presented, and so were directly responsible for the deaths of four teenagers, the injuries of seven, and the trauma of a town. It sounds like this; these proceedings moved very quickly. So I'm curious, how quickly did Ethan plead guilty? And were his parents on the run? Do we know like the time frame here? It sounds like it happened super fast. Everything did happen very quickly. From the very beginning, it was clear to this prosecutor that, you know, she was going to be charging these parents. And James and Jennifer Crumbly were, in fact, charged with four counts each of involuntary manslaughter. Now, these are charges that carry a maximum penalty of 15 years. Now, these two would be held on a combined million-dollar bond, and their lawyers motioned to reduce the bond, and this was denied twice. But where were they? Where did they go? Okay, so let me explain this. Okay. Now, after the shoot, like right after the shooting happened, James and Jennifer had gone to the police station to be interviewed, and they were cooperating. They were released, and they seemingly disappeared. Now, they say they were scared for their lives as they were receiving death threats, so they left their home and went to a hotel. And I can understand this. Their home was Mm -hmm. being processed. There's a lot going on. But then, after the charges were announced, rather than turning themselves in, this is when they left town. And this is when they stopped responding to phone calls and text messages. Now, there was a $10,000 reward offered, and the U.S. Marshals were now involved in the hunt. So it would not be long before they were apprehended. Where were they? Okay, the very next day they were caught and they were hiding in a friend's Detroit art studio. Not only were they hiding in a locked room in this studio, they had four burner phones, one that they tried to destroy, four gift cards, 10 credit cards, and more than $6,000 in cash. This doesn't look very good. I think it seems pretty clear that they were looking to go on the run. They were, that looks like they're Full on fleeing. So they're leaving their child too? They are leaving their mentally unstable son to face murder charges by himself while evading the law. Wow. Wait, Megan, it gets worse because not only that, they cleared out Ethan's bank account and Jennifer allegedly told a friend that her son's destiny is done and she now needs to take care of herself. I mean, this just doesn't look good. You know, this is going to be um, terrible later on when they're apprehended and at the trials. Yes. And this evidence only added to the gross negligence case that the prosecutor was building against the couple by showing that the Crumbleys failed to exercise what is known as ordinary care. Right. Now, this is also known as reasonable care or due care, depending on where you are. I know you know all about this. I see you shaking your head. I do. Yeah. So let me explain this a little bit. Ordinary care is usually applied in civil suits to help prove negligence. Like, for example, if a neighbor got injured on your property, you could be held liable because you didn't exercise ordinary care maybe by fixing a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Now, the law is based on the idea that an ordinary person would take care of their home, such as maybe fix the hole in the sidewalk Mm -hmm. to avoid potential injuries. And these are what are known as foreseeable incidences. If they don't, then this is considered negligence, which isn't, generally speaking, criminal, which is why, again, it's usually reserved for civil cases. However, in criminal cases, gross negligence is the standard, and that's what the prosecutor here was using to support a homicide charge. And gross negligence is worse than negligence. So, for example, um, this might be a doctor who prescribes a drug without talking about potential side effects of maybe falling asleep and then someone falls asleep at the wheel and kills someone or even a parent forgetting a baby locked in a hot parked car. We've seen these types of cases before. We have. And in this case, prosecutor Karen McDonald used the word egregious to indicate an extraordinary criminal level of negligence. And I also want to note, Megan, that gross negligence is not a subjective charge. And what I mean by that is that the jury can't convict simply because they believe the Crumbleys were, say, bad parents. Mm -hmm. There needs to be concrete evidence of the gross negligence. Mm -hmm. In fact, in Michigan, to convict someone of manslaughter using the gross negligence standard, prosecutors must prove that the defendant knew of a potentially dangerous situation, that they could have averted harm through ordinary care, and that the disastrous harm to others presented by the circumstances would have been apparent to an ordinary mind. Again, this is the idea of foreseeable. Yes, 
And to prove foreseeability, Karen McDonald was going to have to show a jury that if the Crumbleys had exercised this ordinary care, then they would have been able to know that their son could endanger lives. Mm -hmm. And this is this is challenging to prove because how is one really to know how their child might react? Well, yes, I think it's a very hard, even though it's supposed to be an objective standard, it's kind of a subjective, subjective decision by parents. I think they have an easier time in this case demonstrating the standard, to be honest. I would agree with you. And, you know, enough of the legal jargon. Let's get back to the case. Okay. All right. Jennifer and James were found, arrested, and pled not guilty to the charges. Mm Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, as Ethan's case was moving forward in the courts, there were several civil suits being fled as well. In fact, $100 million each against the Oxford School District, saying that violence could have been prevented. Now, during Ethan's court proceedings, prosecutors presented damning evidence of the crumbly parents who bought their son the gun that was used in the shooting. They failed to respond to warning signs exhibited by the shooter prior to the attack. Now, these were kind of the two main issues at hand. Okay, but they're filing the suits against the school or the family? There are civil suits being filed against both the school and the family. Okay. While the criminal proceedings are going forward. All right. Ethan addressed the court in brief remarks ahead of sentencing and told the judge that he wants the victims to be happy and that he wanted to be given whatever sentence that his victims asked for. He said, quote, I am a really bad person. I have done terrible things that no one should ever do. Now, the victims' families all provided statements, and they were very, very impactful and oh, very yeah. hard to read or watch. But if you have a thick skin, go ahead and you know look for those online. Many of the surviving students and victims also spoke about their trauma and the lasting impact of the attack. In fact, nearly 30 victims addressed the court in victim impact statements. And there were also many more who considered speaking, but at the last minute, several decided they were unable to, Mm -hmm. which is likely further evidence of the extreme trauma that was caused. Did Ethan ever say on the record why he did this? I understand he said, I've done bad things, but I didn't know if he actually had his own rationale. Not that we know of. No, not at this point. Okay. Ethan's court-appointed guardian also addressed the judge and asked for leniency. Mm -hmm. She focused on the fact that the defendant was 15 at the time of the crime, Mm -hmm. and she said that he is not the same person that he was. It was further argued that life without parole was not the appropriate sentence, saying, quote, his life is salvageable, his life is rehabilitatable, which I'm not sure that's a word, but that was a direct quote. Mm Mm-hmm. One of the defense attorneys asked the judge to consider a term of years, which she said could potentially see him released by his late 70s, okay. as opposed to life without parole. Yeah, yeah. Saying, quote, even a term of years is a very, very lengthy sentence and may very well be a life sentence. But what it does do is give Ethan the opportunity to demonstrate to everyone that he can be rehabilitated, that he is redeemable, that he can make amends and contribute in a positive way to society upon his release. And Megan, as you could probably guess, I don't disagree with this at all. With asking for years, a term like that? Yeah, just to just to give him something um, to to work for, to work towards at some right. chance of rehabilitation. I mean, we're talking about a sentence that would put him in his very, very late years, if, if at all mm-hmm. possible. And If at all, yeah. And it doesn't mean that you get parole. It means that there's a possibility. So I, I don't mm-hmm. necessarily disagree with this request. I'm with you, Megan, but the judge felt a little bit different. Yeah, well, yeah, the judge ended up imposing a life sentence without the possibility of parole. And this was decided on December 29th, 2023. In handing out the sentence, Judge Kwame Rowe emphasized the extensive planning of the school shooting Mm -hmm. and said that Ethan could have changed his mind at any point, but he did not. Quote, he continued to walk through the school, picking and choosing who was going to die. The judge further called the attack on the classmates an execution and torture. In this case, prosecutors had said that there were no plea deals, reductions, or agreements regarding the sentencing. Just so you know, I don't also, I don't have a strong problem with the judge's decision because I understand that position as well. He's not wrong about the statement. This was an execution. Mm -hmm. It was one, you know, that was taken about by a 15-year-old, but Mm -hmm. a life sentence is also probably appropriate as well. Yeah. 
So that's where Ethan is. You know, Ethan is residing in prison without the possibility of parole. Mm -hmm. However, his lawyers have already started to file appeals. And I sure. believe they are not trying to appeal the verdict. They are trying to appeal the sentence, which right. I think it's very possible that they will win on appeal given his age and given Miller. Yeah, I think there's a possibility here, too. All right. So what about Jennifer? Let's go back to that. Thanks. All right. So at first, reports claim that Jennifer and James would be tried together. I think we could agree that's not a smart choice, and I'm sure their attorneys quickly made a motion to sever their cases, and the two would be tried separately. Yeah, well, I think they need to be able to point the finger at each other. Um, it's not going to be good if the jury sees them sitting together. Yeah. I think the only hope in this case is that for each of them is to think the other person is going to go down for this. Yep. Jennifer's case came first. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this is like chivalry, like ladies first. I don't know if that played a role here, <laughs> but... In all seriousness, I'm sure there was a strategy to this. Yeah. You know, her case seems to be much stronger. And I wonder if the lawyers have a say or if the judge is the one who makes the call as far as which one goes first. I would bet it's the prosecutor, but I'm not sure. There's reasons. Like, could be like one of the lawyers was unavailable during the time. Mm -hmm. You know, there could be yep. these administrative reasons we don't even know behind this as well. That's very true. Jennifer's trial began on January 23rd, 2024, and again, she was facing four counts of involuntary manslaughter. The prosecution argued that Jennifer was responsible for the deaths because she was, quote, grossly negligent in giving a gun to her son, Ethan, who was 15 at the time, and also for failing to get him proper mental health treatment despite many warning signs. Mm -hmm. Over a week of testimony, law enforcement officials, school employees, shooting victims, and those who knew Jennifer Crumbly testified for the prosecution. Now, the defense tried to shift blame to her husband, James, for improperly securing the firearm. But as mentioned earlier, there were no safe storage laws in Michigan, meaning that even if the Crumblies did have the gun unlocked the night before the shooting, they wouldn't have been committing a crime. Wasn't James also the purchaser of the weapon? Yes. Which I'm sure they tried to point that out as well, that he was the one who oh, actually yeah. we'll, purchased the weapon. Yeah, we'll get to that also um, in just a moment. Okay. Of course, the defense was also placing blame on the school for failing to notify her about her son's behavioral issues, which I don't think that's the case. It sounds like no. the school did let her know. Yeah. And the defense also, of course, was placing blame on Ethan himself since he was the one who planned the attack and carried it out. Right. The defense attorney focused a lot on what she considered a dangerous precedent for parents everywhere, mm -hmm. stating, quote, can every parent really be responsible for everything their children do, especially when it's not foreseeable? Well, that's the key question. That's the word here, foreseeable. Was foreseeable. it or was it not? It so that's the standard. Yep. So Jennifer testified. I don't think she had a choice in this case. We no. know it's not always smart to let a defendant testify. But in this situation, I, I don't see any other way. Do you agree? Yeah, no, I, I don't see how they could have elicited some of this information. Mm -hmm. She had to speak to the messages because the prosecution would have presented. Mm -hmm. Well, she had these messages. She had yeah. clear communication. There were these signs. She has to defend that somehow or explain how mm -hmm. she was interpreting that yep. to make it, you know, to lessen the culpability or impact. Did you watch the trial at all? I know you're into trials. I am. And I did watch part of it. I, did you see her testify? I watched part of her testimony. I wasn't able to watch all of it, though, because, you know, teaching our jobs <laughs> <Life>. keep interfering <laughs> with, no you know, my trial watching. <laughs> yeah. um, but I was able to see parts of it, parts of it. Um, and I had my own opinions about information that was allowed or not allowed yes. in the trial as well. So would you would you agree, though, that she wasn't very likable? She was, I would not say she was very likable. No, no. She wasn't. In fact, I would say she was defensive and short. And we have said, we don't like to judge people's affect. And we talk about that many times over and over again on this podcast. But I think in this case, I don't think she was doing herself any favors by coming off the way she did. Well, it doesn't matter if we're judging her affect. The jury is. What matters is the jury's yeah. perception of her. So I. But if, if we have this perception, then the jury likely did as well. Well, that's what I mean. So yeah. she has to be prepped in a certain way. She's not the, I mean, don't get me wrong. I've seen people who are worse testify mm -hmm. for sure and, yeah. and the level of defensiveness, but mm -hmm. she just wasn't, I guess the, the best word I would have left it is she wasn't likable. Well, yeah. And she, I think one of her biggest issues is she expressed no remorse or regret right. for her actions. Right. She seems cold and emotionless. And I think the nail in her coffin was, quote, I've asked myself if I would have done anything differently and I wouldn't have. Yeah. 
Now, it is very possible that her lawyer coached her to say this because I bet what happened here is if Jennifer said she would have done something different, then it may have come off as her or may have come off as though she was admitting to wrongdoing. And then that whole foreseeability question would be answered. Yes. I don't know. What do you think? I think she couldn't say I would have done this because, yes, it lends credibility to foreseeability. Mm -hmm. However, I do think that she could have said something to the effect of, I can't see what I could have done differently, but I am so sorry that this has happened or I feel so terrible. Um, So I think there was probably a middle ground way to express remorse if she really had it or sorrow or sympathy. You know, unfortunately, none of that came across. I mean, this is a disaster at the hands of her child. Mm -hmm. And I think most parents, even if they don't intelligibly believe that they are responsible or feel that will feel badly. They're humans. They're people. They're going to just feel terrible. Yeah, I think, you know, four people died and those victims' families and all the countless people who were affected either uh, by injuries or just the trauma of it all. You're telling me that you would do nothing different with all of this harm that was caused. It's It was really... A, not the right way to go. And I hope no. that it's because she was coached because I would hate to think that she's just that callous of an individual. But if she was coached, that's ter- I would think terrible coaching as well. Well, then I think she has an ineffective assistance of counsel issue on her hands. Okay. All right. So recall the texts from Ethan. These obviously played a big role as yeah. well. Uh, Jennifer said the texts about the ghosts were just Ethan messing around. And she says they were part of an ongoing joke about their house being haunted. She also said that his text to a friend was false and that he never had actually asked them for help. I mean, what's she going to say? You know, this is this is her defense. She's trying to minimize these texts and make them, you know, Mm -hmm. less serious than they possibly were. Yeah. She went on to say, quote, I thought we were pretty close. We would talk. We did a lot of things together. I trusted him and I felt like I had an open door and he could come to me about anything. I felt as a family, the three of us were very close. Um, She even went as far to say that she was a helicopter parent, which I don't even think is possible given the amount of time that she spent outside of the home. Right. Um, There's no reports of her and Ethan doing much together. Um, She never brought him with her to visit the horses. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that she had to. If he wasn't interested, then he shouldn't go. But I'm just saying all the things that she her extracurricular activities did not involve him in any way. Right. As you brought up, Megan, this the part of safely storing the gun and the, really the purchase of the gun was a big point as well. She said that she didn't feel comfortable being in charge of that. It was more his thing. So she's saying she let him handle that because she didn't feel comfortable putting the lock thing on it, as she says. Yeah, I remember her saying that she wasn't that comfortable around guns either. It was more their thing. But then you have the footage of her mm-hmm. at the firing range. So yeah. The defense called no other witnesses, and many may find this strange because it would seem beneficial to have people speak about her as a mother. So this has to make you wonder, could they not find anyone who was willing to do it or who had nice things to say? Or maybe there's a strategic reason why they called no witnesses. I'm not quite sure. I mean, in court cases, the burden is not on the defense. They don't have to call any witnesses, and sometimes they don't. However, in this case, I think it would have helped Jennifer to have somebody say that she was a good mother. Yeah, I think it would have helped. However, there are any countless number of cases that we've definitely covered and I've looked at where the defense calls no witnesses Mm -hmm. when they view their job as being, you know, I I cracked reasonable doubt. And in this case, they probably thought they had a stronger case for reasonable doubt when it came to the issue of holding parents responsible. Mm -hmm. Though, yeah, if I was on the jury, I would have wanted to hear someone speak to Jennifer's parenting for sure or the relationship. Yeah. that she had with her son. So I think it was a mistake. I, I totally agree. And in case people don't realize, Ethan would not have been able, some people are questioning why didn't Ethan, you know, why wasn't Ethan called for the prosecution? But that's because he's in the appeals process. So that would yeah. be a violation, a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. Well, he might not have said anything good either. I mean. No, I'm saying if anything, he would have been a good prosecution witness. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Yes. So after deliberating for 11 hours on February 6, 2024, a jury found Jennifer Crumbly guilty of four counts of involuntary manslaughter in connection with the shooting. And this is one count for each victim. 
As of now, Jennifer is scheduled to be sentenced on April 9th and faces up to 15 years of imprisonment. So Megan, at first I thought that the max could be 60 years since there are four charges that each carry a max of 15. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that in Michigan, the sentences must be served concurrently. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if this is common in other states, but I know in some places they can be served consecutively. So here, the harshest possible sentence for Jennifer will be 15 years. And recall, remember, she will also get two years for time served. So for our listeners who don't know, I'm sure a lot of people do, but concurrently means the sentences are combined into one. So 15 years for each count really means 15 years total for all counts. Correct. In states where it's allowed to be consecutive, she would be facing up to 60 years. Okay. As of now, James's trial is set to begin on March 5th, unless he takes a plea, which I think is a real possibility now that Jennifer was found guilty. What do you think? Right. Yeah. I mean, that is kind of the benefit to the second person who goes, right? Mm -hmm. You get to see what the outcome was. Uh It it wasn't good. Uh, It either means that he'll see, you know, people were not pleased and they they found them responsible, Mm -hmm. or it means that they changed their strategy. Uh So it means maybe not change. Maybe their strategy has always been make him more sympathetic Mm -hmm. instead of more defensive. Make him a victim. Yes. Yes. They may make James the victim of Jennifer's control. It's possible or, you know, I don't know. I think, look, they have him purchasing the gun Mm -hmm. and saying it's for his child. So I don't think that's going to bode well. So regardless, I think you're right. It's going to increase the likelihood of him taking a deal. I believe that for sure. Yes. And unfortunate for him right now, Jennifer's sentencing is scheduled for after his trial starts, because I'm sure he would love to see what her sentence is before he makes his decision. But unfortunately, that's not going to happen for him. I want to say something about Jennifer's trial, because I watched it and I watched the judicial decisions as well. And I believed the evidence did demonstrate that she was culpable. I believe the finding based on what the jury heard and saw was likely proper. And I do believe she's guilty. Mm -hmm. I believe there was foreseeable risk of actions taken by Ethan. And I believe she's culpable. However, one thing that I thought was not fair was that the judge allowed testimony about Jennifer's extramarital affairs. And this was something that I thought was prejudicial. Mm -hmm. And I thought instead of focusing on her behavior. This kind of vilified her as a bad mom. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about that on women in crime. Women who are seen as bad or violating their gender norms Mm -hmm. suffer worse punishment. I did not think that this was had a real place in this trial. I'm not sure how you felt about that. I would agree with that. I think it was brought up just to show that she was too busy doing her own thing to be able to be a good mother to Ethan. But I do also think it's not fair Because as a woman, we see this happen. I also think it's not fair that if she's being seen as more culpable than James, just because she's the mother and mom should be more in tune to what's going on with their kids. So there's a lot of gender stuff going on here. I don't think it was brought up by the prosecution to show she didn't have enough time to be a good mother. I think it was brought up. Well, that's what you said. So I think it was brought up to dirty her up. And I think it probably worked. I mean, you know, aside from that, I think she likely would have been convicted. Yeah, I think there's the plenty evidence... of other. Yeah. Yes, but I didn't like it and I didn't agree with that decision. So that was the only problem I had. They did go even as far to say like where the affair happened, how she was on adult finder when she traveled for business, like things that were just not relevant that not yes, relevant. Were definitely. Yep. Um. So as far as like I said, you know, James Crumbly, we'll see what happens with him. But a judge has denied his request for a change of venue. What I thought was interesting, the judge didn't completely close the door on the matter, though. The judge said that he could renew his request for change of venue during jury selection if necessary. So that's another thing to kind of keep our eye on. Well, they're allowing for the possibility that when they go through voir dire, that there are going to be so many jurors that are way too tainted by the press Mm -hmm. that they won't be able to find enough of a jury pool who can actually be unprejudicial. I agree. Um. What I found interesting is one of the jurors came forward and said to the media that it came down to the fact that Jennifer was the last adult with the gun. I think that's interesting, maybe meaning that she was the last adult with the gun because they were at the shooting range together. I'm not, you know, I'm not quite sure about that. It, it doesn't seem to me that that's one of the strongest points here. 
Unless we just don't understand the interpretation of it. And it, something about that last exchange had an impact or mm -hmm. what it was. But yep. it's part of the totality of the situation. Yeah. Now, the prosecution and the defense are not allowed to speak publicly about Jennifer's case until the end of James Crumbly's trial. So the judge has the judge has issued a gag order in this case. Mm -hmm. Many people have been speculating about the role that Jennifer's verdict might play in James's trial. It's interesting to think, will she be the fall guy? Like, will people feel like, OK, someone's being held responsible or will her testimony regarding the gun and the storage and, you know, what she was talking about? Or will her testimony regarding the gun and the storage issues, will that be used to hurt James? Um, I guess we'll just have to kind of wait and see. Mm -hmm. But while this groundbreaking verdict has been applauded as a win for gun violence prevention, there's been a lot of heavy criticism for potentially creating a legal slippery slope. Now, we have to make it clear that this case will not set a legal precedent per se. It's not a Supreme Court case, meaning that if it's a Supreme Court case, it can set a legal precedent, but it's on the state level. However, it indicates to prosecutors that these types of charges can be filed and can be won in a court. Mm -hmm. Again, there's a lot to unpack. We've been unpacking a little bit as we're going, but there's a few areas I'd love to kind of focus on here. Sure. Now, this case is very novel and it sets what many say is potentially a dangerous precedent. But I'm not so sure I agree with that because I think in this case, it was unique in that there was very strong evidence of two things, of both Jennifer ignoring her son's mental health and also the issue of gun safety and gun access. So you kind of have these two prongs. And I think in a lot of other cases, it's difficult to be able to hit it on both of them. Mm -hmm. Prosecutors will likely in the future look at parental neglect and culpability through a different lens because of this case. So this raises many questions. Is it possible that this will be applied to other cases of children committing a crime when a parent was possibly aware of an issue going down? Is it possible this is going to come down harder on parents who are struggling financially? Will it be applied retroactively? Oh, yeah. Um, I think it could also expand criminal liability to a point where we're then increasing convictions and incarcerations in an already overpopulated system. So I think there are many potential implications of this ruling. So many. And some of the, them are going to be unintended consequences that will probably wind up impacting people who are already struggling, mm -hmm. unfortunately. If you looked at the set of circumstances here, this is unique. And if you applied it to those cases in which the actions by the offender or the child were really extreme, then you might say this is only going to be applied in a small percent of cases, mm -hmm. but we don't know how far this is going to go and, yeah. and what kind of acts parents are going to be held responsible for. Mm -hmm. I do think it's a slippery slope, even though I agree with the decision to both charge Jennifer and convict her, because I do mm -hmm. believe she demonstrated what I would call objectively gross negligence. I would agree. And, you know, there have been other cases in which parents were charged for shootings carried out by mm -hmm. their children. Yep. But what's important here is this is the first time it has been with a school mass shooting. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you recall this past November when mom Deja Taylor was sentenced to 21 months in prison after her six-year-old son used her gun in a non-fatal shooting of his first grade teacher. You recall that case? Absolutely. Yeah. It's the first one that kind of popped into mind with this one when they said, well, parents haven't been held responsible. It's not the same, yeah. but it's not true that parents aren't no. held responsible. And it's a little different. I mean, this case mm -hmm. really hinged on the fact that the gun was not safely stored. Yes. So in this case, I believe she took a plea, which included child neglect, among other charges. Speaking of the Deja Taylor case, mm -hmm. there are some similarities between her and Jennifer Crumbly because they were both portrayed as, quote, bad moms. Mm -hmm. If you recall, in that case, there were also extramarital affairs. There was some marijuana consumption. So, you know, we see these patterns with the way the media depicts women in these cases. Sure. And there were some other examples about parents being charged with crimes of their children. Mm -hmm. um, there was another one this past summer. It was a father of a mass shooter in Chicago. This father was accused of wrongdoing after he signed his son's application for an Illinois firearm owner's identification card. And this was after his son had displayed some concerning behavior. Okay. I mean, in this case, the father also took a plea and served, I believe, about like 60 days in jail. All right. So this isn't new. There are some parents who have been charged in cases similar. 
Jennifer's case, though, in particular, leaves many wondering if this will be applied retroactively to other school shooting cases, particularly cases where the shooter died by suicide and no one has, quote, been held accountable. I'm not sure we're going to see that, but it would be interesting to keep an eye on. I think it's a possibility, but I don't think it's a probability. Yeah. And, you know, in these other mass shooter cases, we see the cases usually end up in civil suits. Mm -hmm. Um, For example, in the Columbine case, there were 36 lawsuits filed by the families that named um, Dylan Klebold's parents as defendants. Right. Then in the Sandy Hook shooting, several families sued the estate of the shooter's mother. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, one of the Parkland shooting survivors sued the shooter's foster parents for ignoring potential signs of mental health issues. Right. 19 states and the District of Columbia have passed child access prevention laws that impose criminal penalties on people from inadequately guarding their guns from children. Now, some are very strict, as in California, where it is illegal to negligently store a firearm that a child might access. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about even a gun that's unloaded in California. Okay. Some are less strict, as in Illinois, where criminal responsibility of the parent is invoked only if the child uses the weapon to kill or seriously injure someone. I think you'll find this interesting since you teach policy analysis. We've Mm -hmm. already seen some huge policy changes since the ruling. Now, just a week after the verdict, on February 13th, 2024, a Michigan law was passed which requires the secure storage of firearms. The new secure storage law requires individuals to keep unattended weapons unloaded and locked with a locking device or stored in a locked box or container if it is reasonably known that a minor is likely to be present on the premises. Now, this was clearly prompted by this case, Mm -hmm. but gun safety has been an ongoing concern. Right. Statistics indicate that in 2020, firearms became the number one cause of death for children in the United States and in Michigan specifically. And this was surpassing motor vehicles death and those caused by other injuries. Mm -hmm. And just days after being passed, a man was prosecuted under this new law. This was after his two-year-old daughter shot herself in the head with his revolver. Luckily, this child survived, but is in critical condition. This man was arraigned on several felony charges, including first-degree child abuse and violation of the state's new gun control law. And he is being held on $250,000 bail. And this man can face up to life in prison for his charges. So we're going to be definitely keeping an eye on this case also. Wow. And that's not all. Michigan is doing even more to help keep children and communities safe. To help cover the cost of purchasing firearm safety devices, additional legislation made these devices exempt from sales and taxes. In Michigan, free gun safety kits can also be obtained through Project Child Safe law enforcement partners across the state. They're also working to make gun locks available free of charge. So this is a situation where an event is really having an impact on policy in the right direction. Yeah, normally I'm not in favor of quick legislation being passed. I know. Uh, that's what I, it's one of the tenets of policy analysis that you need more thoughtful. But there are some changes that are just common sense changes that could be passed quickly mm-hmm. that could reduce deaths that I certainly don't oppose. Yeah, I think these are these are examples of some really good policy. I don't see many unintended consequences with at least the you know, giving the locks and the gun safety to residents. Of course not. No. No, absolutely not. All right. So let's turn to some theories about Jennifer. Or, you know, do we think maybe she missed all the signs because she was in denial? She had something going on with her mental health? Or she's simply just selfish and focusing on her own life and she didn't notice what was going on? She strikes me as someone who can possibly have a personality disorder. She could be narcissistic. She does seem to be blaming everyone else for her problems and for things that happen in her life, which is something we see often in people with a personality disorder. I couldn't say exactly what was going on in her life, but I do see evidence of denial of responsibility, that it was hers, that she had any part. Might have just been the legal strategy, but for me, it looks like you know someone who's using techniques of neutralization, someone who believes that they've done nothing wrong, but that the responsibility lies with other forces and is therefore blaming other people. But, you know, it's really hard to know what's going on under the surface. Yeah, there's no way we could really know what's going on with Jennifer's mental health. And as far as I know, she was not given any sort of forensic assessment in the courts. But I think it's possible. I don't think that's a justification or an excuse for her behavior, but just a way to 
try to help us better understand how things went so wrong in this case. As we mentioned earlier, we will update you as things develop in this case, and we will keep a close eye on what is going on here. Right. Um, I thank you all for joining us today, and we will catch you next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is written and hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer is James Varga. Script editing is by Abigail Bel Castro. Audio editing is by Siler Burr and Jose Alfonso. And music is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, please remember to follow and leave a review. You can also support the show through Patreon, where you can get access to additional ad-free content such as exclusive full-length episodes, lectures, a book club, and virtual happy hours with Megan and Amy. For more information, visit patreon.com slash women and prime. Sources for today's episode include Detroit News, New York Magazine, Justia.com, The Equal Justice Initiative, Fox 2 Detroit, Detroit Free Press, AP News, The New York Times, ABC News, NBC News, CNN, CBS News, 19thnews.org, and Michigan.gov.